Good morning, FBC. I'm James, the Encounter Worship Leader. And I'm Hannah, and we're here to bring you today's announcements. The Bolivar Rotary Club wants to invite you to the annual Celebration of Freedom tomorrow at Southwest Baptist University to celebrate Independence Day. Entertainment begins at 6 p.m. with the firework extravaganza beginning around 9.20 p.m. It's almost time for Women's BBS. This event kicks off Thursday and Friday from 6 to 9 p.m. There will be a Bible study, worship, games, crafts, and snacks. Please visit the Women's Ministry tab of the church website to let the Women's Ministry team know you're coming. We are currently accepting donations of composition notebooks through the month of July. You can donate them in the church lobbies or the church office. We'll be donating them to the school supply extravaganza in August. High school students, registration is open for the high school mission trip. There are limited spots available, so don't wait to sign up. This mission trip will be in Memphis, Tennessee from July 17th to July 22nd. We will be partnering with Straight Reach Ministries, which is a ministry located in an impoverished area of North Memphis, Tennessee. Don't forget that our Wednesday night at the Esquire services have moved outside for the summer. Join us at 7 p.m. every Wednesday outside for music, comedy, and a great message. Before we go, we just want to remind you that our office will be closed tomorrow in observance of Independence Day. If you haven't already, we want to invite you to go to our Facebook or our Instagram and follow us at First Baptist Bolivar or visit our website to learn more about First Baptist. We hope that you enjoy the service. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist. We're so glad you're here today. We want to welcome those who are watching online or listening on the radio as well. If this is one of your first times worshiping with us, we'd invite you to text the word guest to the number on the screen, 417-282-8322. Or after the service in the uh, lobbies, we have tables called the Info Hub. There will be someone there who would love to meet you and connect with you face to face and help you get more connected with First Baptist. Let's begin this morning with a reading from God's word from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. And he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Let's stand together and exalt Christ by singing, I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. Hymn 314. <laughs>
Joseph with hymn number 304, Crown Him with Many Crowns. continue our worship with by singing hymn 642 God of our fathers let's stand together as we sing
Father God, everything we have is yours. Forgive us for not acting like it sometimes, Lord. Father, I pray that um, you'd forgive me, forgive us for spending more time this week thinking about what we can get instead of what we can give. Lord, please um, heal our hearts of greed. Make us a people who are marked by generosity. Make us a people who um, today in our giving here in your house and as we walk about your world, that we would be people who use our money um, in the ways that you call us to, that we would care for the marginalized and the poor, those who serve us and those who don't have anything that we can see of value to give us, Lord. Help us to love our neighbors and to love you and how we use our money. May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.
reading from Romans 8, verses 1 through 4. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Let's continue our worship by singing Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Oh 
Well, good morning. It's good to see everybody. If you have your Bible, and I pray that you do, would you join me in Jeremiah 29? Jeremiah 29, and in just a few moments, we're going to walk together through verses 1 through 11. As you find your place there, let me take just a moment to say I am thrilled, I'm excited that the day has finally arrived. It's somewhat surreal, but I am glad to be starting on this July 3rd officially together in the ministry that God has called us to do. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. It's very kind. Not as a guest filling in or someone that's uh, candidating to be pastor, but as your senior pastor. And as I think about that, I'd just like to say thank you. First of all, I think collectively together, we just say thank you to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, don't we? And, uh, and just, I say that knowing and recognizing that He has been faithful to and through your church for many, many years. And I just get to come and be a part of that, and that's really cool. But we also thank Him that He saw fit to put us together in this way, and, and we're going to go forward together. The other thing I would say, I'm just so thankful also for the Pastor Search team. I know some members of the Pastor Search team are in this room, and they were a joy, and it was a privilege to work with them and to walk through this process, and they made it so enjoyable and easy. So thank you to your Pastor Search team. And then I would also say thank you to the staff I have already been in the office with them some this week and getting to know them, and they are great, and I look forward to many, many years, many years of serving alongside them as a team, and I think we're going to do that. And then the final thing I would say is just thank you to the congregation. You've already ministered to my family. Many of you have brought us meals, and we are thankful. It's been, I, I, so I'm a runner. I have been running already the last two weeks that I've been here. And I'm not talking about like little running, like miles. And somehow, I, somehow I've still gained like three or four pounds. I can't quite figure that out. But I think it's because you keep loading my refrigerator up. So thank you for ministering to us in that way. And then uh, just thank you for being who you are. And I look forward to serving the Lord together. Amen? We'll say more about that later as time goes on. But for now, let's turn our attention to God's Word here Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 1 through 11. And as we do that, it is not lost on me what today is and specifically what tomorrow is where we recognize the independence of our nation and we celebrate the 4th of July. And that's, that's not insignificant. That is a, a significant time for Bolivar and Missouri and the United States. When I think about the 4th of July, it's hard for me not to think about a specifically movie that I would say is now culturally iconic. And the movie that I'm talking about is the 1998 war film, Saving Private Ryan. Now, let me be very careful. This is not my endorsement of the movie. There's probably some reasons why, as a Christian or pastor, I could say we got to act with some caution towards watching that movie. The language is not the best. There's a lot of gore. However, most people will tell you, in some ways, it may be the most accurate depiction what we have as what some events of World War II were like, and specifically what comes to mind is that opening scene where they stormed the beaches of Normandy. And I would just say that to you, not in a lighthearted way, but if you've ever seen that, it's almost hard to get to the rest of the movie because that is so haunting. It's haunting, and you think for a moment, right, this is just a movie. It's haunting on screen. But then you sit for a minute, and you realize this thought crosses your mind, this really happened. And it makes it even more haunting, right? There is an underlying current that runs, a theme that runs underneath the action that you're seeing that is depicted pretty early in the movie. It's not caught by everyone, but it's there. And it's this, it's this idea that the Allied troops refuse to surrender in battles even when all seems lost. Yet the German soldiers are all too ready to surrender when something begins to happen that's less advantageous for them. Now, we might ask ourselves the question, why is that? Well, I would say no one of the reason why is it is because it's Hollywood magic and they can make it any way they want. And that's one of the reasons that way, it's that way. But I do think there's an underlying truth that, that kind of permeates that question. And it's this, if I can say it this way, because the American soldiers were fighting for the, the defense of freedom and the perseverance of freedom. And the Germans were fighting, the German soldiers were fighting out of really nothing more than fear. And the good of freedom always, in my opinion, will outweigh the despair of fear. 
And here's what I would say to you as we think about where we are as a church and as a nation, that, that the American ideal is built on this, this concept of freedom and the, and the fight for freedoms. And even when in the history of our nation we have executed those freedoms and those fights in less than an ideal way, and we must acknowledge that we have. We're not perfect. Certainly we've done that. I still think that underlying idea is worth, worth being thankful for. And, and we, I think we must look at the history of the United States and say, look, not in the same way of Israel, but God's hand has been on the United States. And for that, I'm thankful. And that's, that's worth celebrating, and that's worth being thankful for, which perhaps therein lies the question. It's a question that is really asked in the fabric of our society now as we think about all that, and this is really where I want to go today. Is it okay to be a Christian and to be proud to be an American? I think there was one day that maybe we didn't ask that question, but that question is being asked or thrust upon us now. To say it another way, is it okay to be a Christian and to be patriotic? I think the question even gets a little bit deeper. What does, if I'm a Christian, my patriotism look like in conjunction with my faith? But really what I want to look at today as we think about this passage of Scripture is, as a Christian, as a Christian, what do I owe America? And that's where I'd like to settle for just a moment. And I'd like to settle there as we consider what might seem like a strange passage to begin with, where Israel, the covenant people of God, find themselves exiled in Babylon. But as we look at this passage, I think we will be led to some application that helps us answer that, those questions. And so that's what I want us to look at today. I want to look at this passage really in three parts. And the first part we see in verses 1 through 4, and it's what I'll call the problem. Settled in a secular society. Look with me in verses 1 through 4. Now these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exile, the priests and the prophets and the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King jo Jokaniah and the queen mother and the court officials and the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths, had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Lassah, the son of Shaphan, and Gamariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I've sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. As the first four verses of this chapter opens, the context of, of this passage lets us know that the covenant people of God had at least three immediate problems. Let me try to briefly describe what these problems were this morning. Number one, it probably seems obvious, but they were in exile. And you say, okay, so what? What does that mean? Well, essentially, God had, had placed them in covenant with himself and had called them to obey him and worship him. And for years and years and years, they had re rejected God. They had disobeyed him. They had disobeyed his word and his law. And they had refused to have faith and worship him. And he had been telling them, if you do this, I'm going to punish you. And I'm going to punish you by the hand of a foreign nation. And so that's exactly what happens. And finally, God made good on the promise. You refuse to worship me. You refuse to follow me. You're going to be punished. And so they had been removed from their homeland and placed in this foreign territory. That would be bad enough, but they found themselves in this foreign territory of having false prophets from among them arise. As a matter of fact, the whole context of Jeremiah 29 is essentially this. There are false prophets. By the way, one of the things that got you in trouble in Jerusalem was you listened to false prophets, but now guess what? Even in exile, there's false prophets prophets there. And the whole context of Jeremiah 29 is uh, Jeremiah has written a letter from Jerusalem to Babylon saying, they're false prophets. Stop listening to them. Stop listening to what you got you in problem in the first place. God didn't send them. And really the whole of Jeremiah 29 is about who God has not really sent versus who God has really sent. You know that by their word and who you should listen to. So the question is, what false word were they given? Well, it was essentially this. Uh, you're not going to be there long. That's what the false prophets were saying in Babylon. Don't worry. Don't unpack your bags. God's about to rise up with his mighty right arm. He's about to take care of Babylon, and you're going to be going home. 
The problem is that's not what God is saying. God had put them in there for their disobedience, and they were going to be there a while. So Jeremiah writes and says, do not listen to them. Now, the problem would be bad enough if there were false prophets telling lies. But the bigger problem is it appears from context the people of God, the covenant people of God, were liking the lies. They were seeking the lies, and they were wanting the lies. Basically, lie to us more. They were seeking it out. It reminds me a little bit of what we read in the New Testament in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, where Paul has written to his young protege, Timothy, and he says, above, above all things, preach the Word. And one of the reasons why he gave for preaching the Word is because there are going to be people arise who do not any longer want sound doctrine. But they're going to want their ears tickled, and they're going to, find out, they're going to go out and find the lie. It's very similar to what was happening in exile. And Jeremiah is saying, don't listen to the false prophet. More about that in a moment. The third problem that they have that perhaps relates mo more directly to what we're talking to today is that not only were they in exile, but they were ex in exile in Babylon. And you say, well, so what? <laughs> what does that mean? Wish we had time this morning. We don't. To trace out every usage or reference to the concept of Babylon in the entire Bible. I mean, we could start in Genesis chapter 11 to where on the plain of Shinar they built the Tower of Babel, which was a representation of God, of, of people rejecting God and building a name for themselves. And we could trace that all the way out to where it's used in the book of Revelation as an example of the nation that will rise up against the people of God in disobedience to Him. But suffice this morning is to say this, it is never used in a good light. It's always used in a bad light. And the question becomes, why? Well, quite frankly, it's because Israel saw them as their mortal enemy. But Israel saw them as their mortal enemy because they were the mortal enemy of God himself. And if they're the mortal enemy of God himself, then they're their mortal enemy. The question is, why? Well, because they were pagans. Because they were idol worshipers. Because they rejected the authority of God in every way. As a matter of fact, whatever God said, they were operating and living the, in the exact opposite way. We can say it like this. This was a society that was not seeking the Lord. And that's where they find themselves. That's where they find themselves in exile for disobeying God and God's hand. Now, here's the truth of the matter that we as Americans haven't really had to face and we haven't thought about. Almost universally is the case. Every place that the covenant people of God have found themselves residing and following him and worshiping, almost every place, every society that it's found himself in has been more like Babylon than like Jerusalem. And what I mean by that, not, not following the ways of God, not knowing God, not loving God, not seeking God. We can say it like this. The church has most readily found itself in environments that don't know Jesus love Jesus, or follow Jesus. Matter of fact, America, the last 200 plus years, it's been a little bit of an anomaly that we haven't had that same issue. As a matter of fact, we can take it a step further. Most places where the church exists, it's not only they don't know Jesus, they hate Jesus in the way of Jesus. Shouldn't surprise us, Jesus said that in the Gospel of John as he was talking to his followers. He said, remember if they hate you, remember what? They hated me first. And that's where we found ourselves. I've had occasion to go on a mission trip to India. Now, India does nation, nationwide uh, uh, elections, and they have a nationwide government. But even more tightly than us, they let each state kind of govern itself. The state that I went to when I was there was actually under a, a communist government at the time. And in that state, there are three recognized religions. Two of them probably won't surprise you, Hinduism and Islam, but also there was a Christian state religion there. And here's what the government has basically said there. We're okay with all three. Y'all can coexist as long as you don't take it to the streets. In other words, we don't want to spill it off into the streets because that's where problems happen. Keep it behind closed doors and you're good. In other words, the government has kind of forced them behind closed doors. If I'm being honest about us, We've not really experienced that. The government's not forced us behind closed doors. It's almost like we went in, indoor and shut the door behind ourselves. And the truth of the matter is we need to be willing as God's people, as God's church, to open the door and go back and engage the public square for his good with the gospel of Jesus Christ. With that in mind, that's the problem. So what's the answer? Well, beginning in verse 5 through 8, I think we see some principles that are, in other words, God's answer for his people that has tremendous application for us. Let's call it, let's call it if we can, the, uh, the, uh, the prescription. 
And by that we mean seeking the Lord's shalom. Listen to verse 5 through 8. Build houses and live in them, and plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and become the fathers of sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to your husbands, that they may bear sons and daughters, and multiply there and do not decrease. Seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in it in its welfare you will have welfare. Look at verses 8 and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams which they dream. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. So as we think about the prescription for the problem, seek the Lord's shalom. There are at least, if I can say it this way, Four truths or principles that Jeremiah gives the people that were living in Babylon that I want to show you today that I think will have application for us. So ever so briefly, in verse 5, we see that they were to take up a permanent perspective. Listen again to verse 5. Build houses and live in them, and plant gardens and eat their produce. Now, it's a little bit implied, but we get it, don't we? Why would they need to build houses? Why would they need a permanent residence? Why would they need gardens, a way to get sustenance and food? It's God's way of not so subtly saying, you're going to be there a while. The other prophets are telling you, don't unpack your bags. And Jeremiah is saying, not only is God saying, unpack your bags, but get comfortable. That's what he's saying. Now, in a little bit of a turn of fortune and irony, if you look at when God's good hand placed them in the promised land, you'll notice that when they arrived there, God, Jeremiah, excuse me, Joshua 24, verse 13, he says, you, you lived in houses you didn't build, and you enjoyed fruit of vineyards you didn't plant. In other words, when they went to the promised land, who built the houses that they lived in? We don't know, but the, tr- the, the point is they didn't have to. God and his goodness had built it for them. This is a reminder that they are under the punishment of God. But nonetheless, the idea is although you're not going to be of that city, you've got to live in that city. And you've got to root yourself there. So first of all, God tells them to take up a permanent perspective. You're going to be here a while. Brothers and sisters, we need to realize we might not like everything that we see around us, but we live here and God has put us here. Let's take up a permanent perspective to seek the good of where we are. Which leads to the second principle that we see here in verse 6. It's not only take up a permanent perspective, but it's to honor the Lord's first priority. Look at verse 6. Take wives and become the fathers of sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to your husband, that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there and not decrease. Now you say, why do I say honor God's first priority? Well, because if you go all the way back to Genesis, this should be a echo, a reminder, a hint at the first command that we actually have recorded in Scripture. And what is that? Well, Genesis 1.28, remember? He, at the end of at the sixth day of creation, God creates man. He creates man, in, uh, m- both male and female, creates them in his image, and then he blesses them and he gives them a command. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Now, here's the question. Before Genesis 3 and sin corrupted the world, if they're made in the image of God and they multiply and fill the earth, what are they filling the earth with? The image of God. By their very procreation, they are glorifying God. Now, sin corrupted that, but God did not forget his plan to have his image spread over all the earth. As a matter of fact, the next move that he made is he calls Israel out as a specific people that are going to be his representation in the earth. Well, even in punishment, even in exile, even in Babylon, he doesn't want them wiped out. He doesn't want them dying off because his plan for them is not done. So he calls them to continue to multiply and live and have sons and daughters so that they may continue to, to represent and glorify him. They're to continue to live that God is their God. And then thirdly, in verse uh, 7, we see not only do they need to take up a permanent perspective and honor the Lord's first priority, but maybe most importantly, they are to seek the city's peace. Look at this. Seek the welfare of the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will have welfare. The word that's used here is a very significant Old Testament word. It's the Hebrew word shalom. And even if you don't know Hebrew, you probably recognize that term. Now, we often translate it peace, 
But our English translation of just straight up and down peace probably doesn't do the word justice. It is a word that was really a covenant term in the Old Testament. It means more than just the absence of war, the absence of conflict. And really in its truest form is something that only God can bring and bestow upon people. It carries with it this idea of, of prosperity or inner tranquility or complete spiritual wholeness that only God gives His covenant people. For that reason, God calling His covenant people in Babylon to seek the shalom of Babylon was profound and shocking and maybe even offensive to them in at least two ways. First way, you are calling us to seek the shalom of your mortal enemy, God. You're actually calling us to seek the covenant good of Babylon itself. And that's exactly right. And there's an underlying principle for why. Because if you live there and that place has shalom, guess what the residents are going to have? There's a better chance that the residents will have what if the city as a whole has that? God's goodness. God's good hand on it. So I'll, I'll just stop here for a moment and just say this. Why, why do we as believers do certain things and pray for certain things and desire certain things for Bolivar and Mo Missouri in the United States? Oh boy, uh, day one, I'm about to get controversial and you're going to wonder who in the world you called as pastor. Well, just bear with me for a moment. Because I'm not saying this to be controversial. But why is it that we want the gospel proclaimed in the society in which we live? Why do we pray for our public leaders? Why do we care about who's elected? Why do we say things like we believe in life and, and we're for life from the womb to the tomb? And we do celebrate, although being gracious to those that disagree with us and maybe have a different view, things like we saw last week where Roe versus Wade gets overturned. Why do we do this? It's not because we're trying to be political. And I'm not trying to be political today. It's because, friends, verse 7, we're trying to be biblical. We're trying to be biblical. That's why we're, we, we do this. It was shocking for at least a different reason as well. The other thing is because keep in mind that the Jews in that day and time thought that you sought God and you prayed to God in one location. He was bound by geography. He was bound to Jerusalem and to the temple. Where did a Jew go to seek God and to pray to God? The temple. And Here they're being called not just to seek the good of Babylon, but they're being called to seek God in Babylon. Babylon. None of those things are insignificant, which leads to the final principle that I think we see that Jeremiah called them to in response. Not only take up a permanent perspective, not only honor God's first uh, principle or first priority, and not only seek the city's peace, but finally avoid false prophets. Now, the, the verses 8 and 9, the, the positive way to say that is to seek God's truth. So, why did I say it as avoid false prophets? Because I needed another P to end my sentences because I'm a Baptist preacher. Look at what we read in verses 8 and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets who are in your midst and your diviners deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams which they dream. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name, and I have not sent them, declares the Lord. God is basically saying, don't, don't seek the lie. Don't even listen to it. I, I've not, that didn't come from me. That's not from me. And so if you really want to survive in Babylon and, and you want to be able to, to, to deal with life in a place that's not seeking me, he's basically saying, then seek my true word. Seek my truth. Listen to, the, to my true prophet. Understand it. Apply it to your life. Continue to live by my law. That's what God is saying. Look, the number one principle or application, if we want to seek the good in a society that's not seeking God, or maybe yet if we want to seek the good for a society that's not necessarily seeking God, the number one thing that we need to do is we need to know God, God's truth. We need to pursue God's truth. We need to understand God's truth. We need to, we need to interpret God's truth. We need to apply God's truth to our own life. And we need to live by it. We need to proclaim it. And certainly we need to, uh, to, to show the world what it looks like when it's lived out. That's what we need to do. If we look at all of this, really what God is calling His people to and what God is calling us to is we are called to seek the good of our land. 
by obedience to and worship of Christ above all. Above all. And, and the question is, well, what, what might that mean for us today? If we go back to my first question, what as a Christian do I owe America predominantly? Well, four ever so brief applications from this passage that I think we can see. Number one, hear me say this. Sometimes maybe we're shamed for, for doing this, but it is okay to be proud of and care for where you are from. It's okay. Matter of fact, I would in some ways say, depending, it's biblical to do so. Why did they want to go back to Jerusalem? Because they felt like God's hand had been on them. They had been blessed and they, they cared about it. They wanted to go back home because they cared about where they were from. It's not a sin inherently to care about uh, and be proud of where you're from. Which leads, I think, more directly in this passage, what's even more true in this passage is we are called to seek the Lord's peace and goodness for where we live. And somebody say it this way, we're not going anywhere and neither is it. So we're called to seek the Lord's peace and the Lord's goodness for where we live. Surely if that was true for Israel and Babylon, it's true for First Baptist Bolivar and Bolivar, Missouri, and the United States. Amen? And the reason why, third application, the reason why is this. God is not bound by geography. God is not bound by geography, is he? Let me say it another way. Let me say it another way. God owns it all. And if he taught Israel anything, he certainly taught them that in this passage of Scripture. And then I'm going to show you why in the last two verses, verses 10 and 11, the final truth. The primary way that we seek the good, the Lord's goodness and peace for where we live is through the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you might ask the question why, and here's why. Because even in a society that might be against the truth of Christ, in our obedience, there is a promise for the people of God, and we see it ever so briefly in verses 10 and 11. So we not only see, right, the problem... We not only see the, uh, the prescription, but we fi finally see the promise in this passage of Scripture. And ultimately, the promise is secure in the Savior's certainty. Look at verses 10 and 11. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you and bring you back to this place. Verse 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and, and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Well, just for a moment here as we consider this promise, let's start in verse 11. And you, you say, why? Well, because it's, it's the verse we like, isn't it? Because this, listen, just again. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and a hope. Now, let's just be honest for a moment. This is the verse that you go to Hobby Lobby looking for, <laughs> right? You walk down the aisles, and you look until you find the nice wooden frame of Jeremiah 29, 11 on it, and you buy it, and you take it home, and you put it in your kitchen, your bedroom, or over your couch, right? And look, I'm not saying anything to you that we haven't done. My wife's done the same thing, right? That's what we do. But here's where I get myself in trouble, but just bear with me for a moment. Whatever the promise was and whatever God meant by verse 11, here's what he could not have meant. That every person in earshot of hearing this le letter was going to have the prosperity restored to them in the way that they wanted it. Not every person that heard this. It wasn't a blanket promise to the individual that everybody that heard this was going back to Jerusalem. Well, how do I know that? Well, I know that because of verse 10. Back up. Did you hear what verse 10 said? For thus says the Lord, when 70 years have been completed for Babylon. By the way, never seen in Hobby Lobby verse 10 included with verse 11. That's not in my bedroom or over my couch, just being honest with you, right? Not the 70 years part, because we don't like that part as much as we like verse 11. But it's a part of it. It's part of the context. So, so here's what's going on. Here's how I know. By the way, what does he mean by 70 years? Well, there's two different opinions of it. One is 70 years is basically represent, representative of a human lifetime. Some say, no, actually 70 years back then was formulaic to represent three generations. Either way, here's the truth. There were some adults that heard this letter from Jeremiah, and certainly some senior adults that were going to die in Babylon. They were never going to see Jerusalem again. 
So the question, well, gee, thanks, Pastor. How is that a promise to them and us? Well, here's how it's a promise to them and us. It wasn't a promise so much for the individual. It was a promise to Israel as a whole and what he was promising to do through them. That's what this promise is. We don't have time. You don't want me to get into the theology of this, but there's something in the Old Testament called the corporate solidarity of Israel, meaning God has given his covenant to all of Israel, so when he fulfills his covenant to the whole, the individual is blessed by it. So when he fulfills his promise to Israel, the individuals are blessed. So he's not so much here talking to the individual, he's talking to Israel as a whole. And here's ultimately his purpose is this. He is finally going to bring about... The fulfillment of the promise he made to and really through Israel long ago when he initially called them. What do I mean by that? Genesis chapter 12 when he called Abraham. Remember why he called Abraham and what he said to him? I'm going to make you a great nation. Well, that's only part of it. He said, I'm going to make you a great, great nation and through you all the nations of the earth, what? Will be blessed. So look, essentially what he's doing here is he's making good on that ultimate promise. And that ultimate purpose will come in bringing about a new covenant. That's what he's referring to here. How do I know that? Because just two chapters later, in Jeremiah 31, 31, we read this. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declared the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their hearts I will write it, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again each man his neighbor and each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord, I will forgive their iniquity and their sins. I will remember no more. Ultimately, through this purpose and this promise, God is bringing about a new covenant, which is ultimately the gospel of Jesus Christ, which will be for all people, which will redeem many, which will be declared to all nations. All nations, yes, all nations even Babylon, and even America. Amen? Which is why we understand this is a promise of God's goodness to us, but it's also a call for us, even a society that may not know the Lord and may not be seeking the Lord, for us through the gospel of Jesus Christ to seek the Lord on their behalf for their good, for His peace, for their redemption. It's a little bit like what we read that Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, is it not? We are the salt of the earth, we're the light of the world, and we're to let our light so shine before men so that men see our good works and they don't glorify us. But ultimately what? They glorify our Father who is in heaven. We're out of time this morning, but friends, we are called... Certainly, yes, to be proud of where we're from, but ultimately see the good of where we live and ultimately doing so, understanding God's hand over all of it and ultimately doing so by proclaiming the goodness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our number one priority and that's what we want to work on together. And I say that, and I say that understanding that things are hard right now. Look, I'm not living in a bubble. I understand I just came from a seminary campus and I know things are hard right now. Would you just let me take a moment and say, I, I even understand that to this extent. When I was a teenager growing up, here was the difficulty of being a Christian. Temptation might be so strong that you might fall into temptation, live like the world, and ruin your Christian witness. That's not even the problem anymore. That's not the most difficult thing. The most difficult thing right now is being a Christian in the world in which you live, if you stand up and say so, you're probably going to be the most hated person in the room. I understand all that, but just bear with me. Could it be that what we thinking is a door slamming is actually God opening, kicking a door wide open for his people to stand up and do what he's called us to do all the way back in the Old Testament? Well, what do I mean by that? Well, think about it like this. If we were to leave this place this morning and there was somebody in here that was wanting to get engaged and we could find a jeweler that was open and we were to go to look at some diamonds and the, 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 the jeweler has all these cuts underneath the counter, and we pick a few out, and they pull it out and put it on the counter. The very first thing they're going to do with those cuts of diamond that we pick is they're going to get a black silk or satin cloth, and they're going to lay those diamonds 
on that cloth, right? Why? Because the color and clarity of those diamonds will be shown all the more brilliant by the darkness of that cloth. Could it be that what we think is a door closing is just God dropping the backdrop, just exposing the darkness so that the gospel and Jesus Christ in this dark place could shine all the more brightly? Could it be that a society that we think is against us is not a closed door, but it's an opportunity? And the question for us together, the question for you is, will you take that opportunity? Will I take that opportunity? Will we take that opportunity? With that in mind this morning, would you join me and every head bowed and every eye closed as we transition and we move into a, a time of reflection and response this morning as Brett begins to make his way up to the front. I just want to uh, tell you something as pastor, my first week as pastor, what, what I would like to do and what we're going to kind of re-implement here. We want to give you an opportunity as a part of your worship, as a part of our worship experience this morning, to have a, a chance to publicly respond. Now, we're not doing away with the other opportunities. We'll still be around after the service. You can still text the Connect cards, and all of those things will be shared. But in just a moment, I'm going to pray. When I say amen, I'm going to be standing down here at the front. Our pastoral staff will be available. And if you, as a part of your worship today, need to respond, maybe just need someone to pray with, maybe you want to talk about salvation, maybe you want to explore membership or baptism, we will be here and we would love to talk with you and pray with you this morning as the Lord's leading. Let's pray together and then we'll move into a time of response this morning. Gracious Father, thank you so much for your goodness to us. Thank you so much for calling us to be your witnesses in this world. And thank you for providing the opportunity for us to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this passage of Scripture that reminds us we are never without an advocate. We are never without hope. We are never without a word, and we are never without a witness. Help us to just be those people this morning that will take it up and follow you and honor you with our lives and what we do. You have your way as we respond to you this morning and as we sing. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing, Lord, I need you.
was a blessing. Amen. Hello. It's a blessing. There we go. Thank you. Um, thanks for being here this morning. As Pastor Adam said, we, there are many, many ways to continue to connect with us. We'll be around after the service. You can uh, call the church, church office, drop by, or text connect to that number up there. I also have sad news. Many of you know that our good friend Florian Toma passed on Thursday. His visitation is going to be Tuesday from 2 to 4 at Pitts. Um, we still aren't sure exactly if there is a service where that's going to be and when, and I'm even doing the service. So um, if you will go to the Esquire Facebook page, um, you can get the latest information. Hopefully that will all be clear tomorrow. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. We'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for the reminder that we um, have the opportunity to be involved and used in proclaiming your goodness, the gospel of Jesus Christ, where we are thankful to be part of your purpose for this world. Thank you again for this message. We love you. Dismiss us with your blessing and grace. In Jesus' name, amen.